But we're back with another episode of the Visionary Minds podcast. Uh, episode number five. We got Jay today, so welcome, Jay. Happy to have you on. So hi there. Hi. Um, so all right, let's just get get right into it. Um, why, what are you? Why don't you get into just some of your personal experiences with psychedelics, or you know, perspectives you have on them, or anything related to that? Um, personal experiences with psychedelics. Um, I think I'm probably not the norm with how I started out with psychedelics. Um, I came probably more from an um, a interest in how the brain works, even from a young age. So um, yeah. I will include um, cannabis as a psychedelic um, for me when I was younger, but um, I was just I was interested in um, in what it kind of um, what it actually did to the brain, which which kind of made me curious to smoke it for the first time when I was a teenager, yeah. and. Um, yeah, but um, I was probably a bit young um, with with um, entering that realm because I sort of got caught up in sort of the wrong social groups and things like that with friends um, at right. school and ended up smoking maybe a little too much as you do when you're exploring with something. But um, I um, I ended up pulling away from it, um, but it kind of it threw me more into that interest in psychology, yeah. and um, so I ended up um, learning what I could, reading up on on um, aspects of psychology, and also um, for some reason um, the occult as well from a young age, and um, those two sort of things combined, and right. um, particularly reading um, Jung's work. Um, and uh, sort of philosophies around dream work and things like that. Right. And um, and with that, kind of as I got a bit older, like in my twenties, I sort of got more kind of directed towards psychedelics mm -hmm. um, again, but through um, through that kind of perspective, I guess you could say, yeah, with with just that interest in psychology. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I did experiment with LSD as well and um, and things like that, but um, right. yeah, that's sort of where I started. With well, that. there's so always yeah. um, it's that's kind of always existed uh, an association between psychology and psychedelics. I mean, you know, right. uh, when psychedelics first started kind of coming onto the scene, you know, in the 50s and into the 60s, it was that was the context was like psycholo psychological tools, you know, basically, and uh, people were using it to, uh, you know, um, make faster, more radical and quicker changes in people psychologically uh, through the use of psychedelics, which obviously proved itself to be obviously highly effective. Um, so it's a natural association, yes, I think. Yes. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I know your friend, Timothy Leary, too, so it's, I guess, a yes. part of where he was coming from. So, yeah, yeah, Timothy Leary was uh, obviously a huge figure in it, and he was, you know, he was coming from, I mean, he was a professor of psychology at Harvard uh, at the time, you know, when, when he got into all that, and he was all about, um, you know, and, and he actually, you know, he did studies, um, like, for instance, one study he did that I find fascinating is uh, I was using mushrooms on, uh, on prisoners, and um, I forget, uh, this is more or less right, um, normally within some window of time, Apparently, like 80% of people in prison will return to prison within some window of time. Um, and but the people he uh, so he took a group of people and tried a, a mushroom right. session with them with, with a, a goal of you know getting them out of the criminal mentality or whatever. And um, among that group of people, only 20% uh, returned to prison uh, within that time frame. So that's uh, extremely significant and substantial. And yeah. you know, over and over, yeah. you you find results like that. It's just effective. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what I guess they're um, they're they're doing now. They're finding that those are the same kind of results, if not better, yeah. in um, sort of more um, controlled environments, yeah. well, um, counselling. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for for better or for worse, um, you know, Timothy Leary. A lot of people demonize him in the psychedelic community. Um, 
in, to, in this day, um, which I personally find frustrating. And but what their what their perspective on it is, they basically say like he was like too reckless or whatever and too open about right. everything, and then that kind of fucked everything up. Um, but right. the flip side of it, I think, it's really important to acknowledge that I find to be important, and he obviously did too. And uh, I think people should be more conscious of is what he was what, what he didn't want to happen is the same thing that still could happen that I still don't want to happen. He didn't want psychedelics to come to be seen as literal psychiatric medication. I mean, just think about that. That is the path it could have went, and that's still the path it could go. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, if you have a mental illness, if you have a medicine, you know, that's not the proper... And that, I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it's not a proper right. use of it, but it's not all it is. It's much more than that, and it's very limiting to say that's all it is. Almost like um, the... Uh, what is that Brave New World scenario that's yeah. a dystopia where you just take a pill to, you know, right. solve all your problems, which, yeah, I'm not sure, quite sure whether exactly. LSD would work so well with that anyway. But yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, that's what yeah. they say. Originally, it was, uh, it was all um, the government was using it for, you know, attempts at brainwashing and, and, and stuff yeah, like right. that. Yeah. yeah. And supposedly yeah. it got out, out of control. <laughs> like, they are like, oh, this is yeah. not going to do what we thought it was going to do. Not... Not the best idea. <laughs> yeah, but I think Timothy Leary, it seems to me that it just, it's just the time and the place, and it's almost like it didn't matter who it was, it just, right. it had to happen that way. You know, someone had to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, take a, the discovery of LSD and popularize it, and, yeah. um, and it just so happened to create a kind of a cultural revolution in a way, the whole sort of, you know, um, Free love, happy sixties type of type of thing, but um, but you know, it's just like one of those situations where cultural or um, society had to go through that really um, maybe a challenging or difficult process, um, yeah. and then through over a long period of time, um, you know, evolve through that. Um, right. Through, yeah. you know, I guess politics and all of that kind of stuff, um, even to this day. But it is getting a lot better, right? You were just, yeah, we're, um, we're I know you mentioned before about this whole, well, Colorado and um, Denver. Yeah, uh, Denver just yesterday, and, just yeah, yesterday, right. uh, passed a uh, ballot measure to decriminalize mushrooms. Uh, so that's, um, that's a pretty huge cool. deal, you know, and um, yeah. obviously, obviously Colorado was a big, uh, kind of led the way in terms of legalizing, uh, you know, cannabis um, and f fully legalizing it in the right. state. Yet Colorado seems to be kind of like a nexus uh, where it's all going down right now, the, you know, the transformational energy, at least uh, with regards to this kind of stuff, um, right. you know, legalizing cannabis and now decriminalizing <laughs> mushrooms in Denver, but that's a huge city. And, um, you know, that's a big deal. And I think we're going in the right yeah. direction. It's, it's momentum. Can I just ask you, Kate, to, are you able to clarify on what the, this, is it a bill or a law? Well, what it is, um, is um, so there's, um, you know, politicians pass laws and whatnot, but then there can also be uh, states, states or cities can have uh, voter, like vo voter referendums or, or voter, so if you get a certain number of signatures, um, you right. can get a, a, a specific issue on the ballot. Uh, when people vote, okay. there's a list of, of things that uh, are basically voter-initiated uh, measures. So they got enough signatures uh, to get it on the ballot, and then mm. so then that just became a single issue that was on the ballot that you voted on. Should we, you know, decriminalize mushrooms? And it was kind of interesting. Actually, I'm very excited about it uh, today because last right. night when I went to bed, uh, everything I was seeing said it it, it failed. It didn't it didn't pass. Uh, and honestly, right. at the time, yeah. I. Was, they, everything said that it got about 45% of the vote and didn't quite pass. And honestly, I was like, well, you know, 45%, that's pr pretty good. And that's how I was looking at it. And then and then I woke up today and I, and I see it passed. And apparently what happened is, uh, you know, not all of the uh, <clears throat> ballots had been in yet. And everyone just started running it. All the news agencies just started saying it, it failed, it didn't pass, didn't pass, didn't pass. But then they just kept getting more and more ballots in. And apparently the, the late ballots were very in favor of it, and so then you know you Very wake up cool. the next morning and, and it overturned uh, it overturned it. So when um, when you say ballots, is this um, just the general population putting in votes, or is it people and within the government? Right. Okay. Yeah, it's just wow, it's just people. Really cool. Yeah, and that's yeah, one that's, that's awesome. one nice thing. I think that is a nice thing. I mean, that's how 
I don't know if all, but at least most all of the the cannabis yeah. reform has come through voter initiatives like that, and that's one nice thing, yeah. I guess. I don't know if it gets used as much as it could or should, but it's a nice thing in, in our system, I guess, is the voter initiative thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's oh, totally. Yeah. And just getting information out there and promoting um, awareness and like um, you know just using the internet to do that. It's, it's exactly. It's, um, it's a great tool, but. Yeah, it just takes time, I guess. Um, yeah. But you've got to keep pushing, I think, if it's something you care about. Yeah. Right. But so, can you clarify on what what the what this um, law or bill actually means? Yeah. Like, yeah, what's, right. What's so, um, so you know, well, it's it's that city, uh, just the city, and um, but what it is like, it's a decriminalization bill. So, um, not mm. everyone is is aware of the nuances. So. Like as far as decriminalization and legalization, so uh, decriminalization, which is what passed, is is to say it's not like you're going to be able to buy mushrooms in stores or anything like that. But what it is is mm. they're not going to pursue criminal charges for people having mushrooms. Position. It's just not. Right. It's, it's technically still sort of illegal, uh, but they're just not. So you can't like I said, they won't let you sell it at stores or anything, but they won't pursue criminal <laughs> charges. If you have mushrooms or, or take them, it's not considered to be a criminal offense. Right. Yeah. 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 Is there a certain amount that is involved in the? That's details? a good question. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would assume that there probably is a, a limit, only because it seems like all of the cannabis legislation involves some sort of a, a limit. So I have to assume right, yeah. there's some sort of a limit, but I don't. I so don't it know. might be. Might be pointed more towards personal use, and they kind of stipulate that within the details. Right, but although actually than... now that I think about it, I actually don't know how much uh, uh, the amount would be an issue because I, I think the whole thing of the decriminalization was that it, it's, it, it explicitly says law enforcement must use no resources to pursue criminal charges of mushrooms. So. Wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. Cool. That's uh yeah, so that's a great thing, and um you know I, I think like, you were cool. talking about the '60s and all that, uh, Leary yeah. and that whole movement. I, the way I think about it, kind of, is it's like it's like there's this energy, like this transformational energy, you know, almost within the planet, or, or the right. you know, the human psyche itself, whatever it is, and it's like you know kind of bubbling beneath the surface, this revolutionary transformational energy. And I just think that right. um, it came, it, it like bubbled up in the '60s in a substantial way. I just think it wasn't time. The time hadn't yet been reached uh, to fully let it take yeah. hold, um, and I and like I said, this is how I conceptualize it or like to imagine it. Let's say uh, I like to imagine um, that the internet, like it did, that the internet is some sort of a, a foundational, like a a, 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 um, a grounding technology um, that allows mm -hmm. the transformational energy to take hold. Like you need you need the, it's not, I, maybe you need the internet and that kind of interconnected uh, availability of information. Uh, in order to really solidify certain perspectives, you know, in the masses and human psyche, mm -hmm. to really let that take hold, maybe. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like a, to carry it even in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, you mm. talked about um, you talked about um, you know how in your mind uh, well, it was psychological, but then also you mentioned uh, the occult. And um, that yes. was an interest for you, which I, I, I think that's very interesting, and I love that because to me there's yeah. a clear association. I mean, uh, I find occult ideas suggest themselves <laughs> to me on psychedelics. Um, yeah, right, right. Occult perspectives and whatnot, and um, there's a clear mm -hmm. relationship, I think. Uh, it's interesting because it's sort of not explicit. Um, I don't see a lot of people talk about it, but it seems pretty clear to me. Yeah, sure. I think, um, well, for me anyway, that um, it's more a thing of um, just that inner reflection thing with, with psychedelics or, um, you know, um, mind-altering drugs even, um, just that shifting your perspective, your your actual perspective of how you th see things, so seeing things from a different angle or maybe outside yourself, seeing your right. own life, your own, you know, your own um, sort of um, existence from a different perspective. Yeah. And um, I think that inherently, for me anyway, um, facilitated um, the um, 
sort of, I don't know, interest in ideas yeah. about what is existence, you know, and that just, that that is sort of a part of what um, occult philosophy is about, really. Um, right. But I, I see occult philosophy is um, a very personal thing. You have lots of different systems or belief systems, right. and um, exactly. it's just a matter of, of finding things that work for you, that yeah. you connect with. Um, nothing's right or wrong, you know, it's all just different ways of looking at things. Again, coming back to that, shifting perspectives. Um, yeah. But yeah, also a very inward thing for me. Um, it's not a truly so structured system. Okay. It's very general. There's a lot of authors, there's a lot of different perspectives in there. Uh, I know, like for yeah, me, and right. I imagine a lot of people, when I first started reading that stuff, um, I, to me, the word occult sounded bad. I don't know. I didn't like it. Just maybe that was right. just my perspective, what I came up with, or whatever. The word occult just sounded bad, and I think it does to right. a lot of people. Um, and I, yes, I don't know. This, yeah. this is just semantic, or, or not even semantic, like just the sound almost. But I, I think something about the word cult being in it is. is it's I just, think it's just a. It's a cultural appropriation, is that? No, not quite. It's a thing where, you know, it's used. I guess the word occult is goes back to old stories, but even in modern day film cinema, you know, it's exactly. um, it's a word that's used like in horror movies because it's yeah. hidden or spooky, yeah. you know, and spirit. Exactly. Like that. And I'm really, it just it's a word that um, that basically means hidden or hidden knowledge, you know, which is basically something that's not known as yet, right. or or. Um, or not not yeah. obvious. So I mean, it's a pretty simple concept. It's not necessarily bad or anything like well, that. Well, I kept. Uh, I was. Uh, you know, I was reading a lot of different spiritual texts of, of all different sorts, and um, you know, there were certain texts and authors that I loved. And they right. were identified with the occult, and I was like, all right, well, like I would never want to say occult because it just sounded bad. But then, af as time went on, I'm like, I just, I don't know, like these authors, like the things they're saying are the best ideas that I've come across. Like I love these ideas the best, and, and all of them. Apparently, that's what occult is. That's what occult means because every single one of these texts that say this stuff is classified as occult. So eventually, I'm like, I guess I like the occult. I don't know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it covers so many areas too, really. Yeah. I think when I was younger, um, I found the word occult a bit like that too. Um, but um, I'm the kind of person who will go and research an actual word, and I'm pretty sure I did that. I, I, what, what, where does the word occult come from? And I, you know, um, and I want to understand the the foundations of of words even and and what they mean. Um, yeah. But I kind of I kind of got. Um, I don't know, sort of, I went on a path um, through psychology at, um, with Jung, as I said, um, um, because I was, I was very much interested in how the mind works and, and how my mind worked and why do, I, why, why do I feel or think or experience certain things um, beyond what just other people tell me or, or what, right. what the normal perception about it all is. Um, um, and so um, I connected with Jung, I think, thankfully, um, because it led me onto a path that just seemed quite natural for me um, yeah. through sort of spiritual concepts um, and also, um, yeah, like I said, um, things maybe a bit more later in life that related to psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, but I, um, I definitely... It was a very um, a thing about getting into my own mind, really, and right. trying to understand that first, and then um, and then the outside world and how your mind connects with the outside world and all the energy that goes on with that, and and then other people and the collective, and you know, and um, yeah, yeah. Another person who I who I found really interesting was um, Joseph Campbell, who's a um, a comparative mythologist um, yeah. uh, was, and um, he he kind of helped me understand, um, you know, a lot to do with um, religions and uh, mythologies and how um, how the collective um, aspect of society can work 
um, in those kind of more occult ways, I guess. So, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's uh, you know that comes. I, I, I I'm more familiar with Jung uh, than I am Campbell. I'm right. I guess like yeah. peripherally familiar with Campbell. Like I've come across some stuff by him, but I really haven't read him uh, at this point. I'd like to. Right. Um, yeah. I know, yeah. I know Jung, I mean, that comes back to, I think it relates to, like, you know, Jung and the collective uh, the collective unconscious and the archetypes right. as far as, you know, uh, the universal underpinnings of mythology or whatever. Um, you know, if you think about the idea of a collective consciousness and, um, you know, or the collective unconscious, and, you know, when anywhere, when people develop spiritual systems, there's just these innate impulses or underlying spiritual whatever reality is deep within our psyche and we inevitably uh, project those impulses into really any spiritual system that we create. Right, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, things can come from a, yeah, we can't help but influence things with our own personal psychology, I guess. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I think that um, also, I think it's important to realize that these are all just tools. So even Jungian psychology, um, I, I sort of had this, I don't know, just personal awareness about it or view on it that it's not necessarily like the way he sees things or, or the way he's written out the map of our mind as far as he sees it. It's not the way it necessarily is. It's just a perspective on right. how it, how our minds can can work or you can view it as working. Um, yeah. um, oh, yeah. And it's just a tool. So for me, Jungian psychology is just a tool. You know, you could, yeah. you could interpret how, you know, psychology in different ways than his, and it would still just be a different way of looking at it and a way to work with it. So, and that right. comes back to um, things like the occult or magic as a yeah. system or systems. They're just different ways to, you know, work with reality and, right. and your mind. Yeah, and, that, and, and, that's, and the same with psychedelics too. Yeah, you know. I was just say, yeah. um, you know, psychedelics, and like you talked about. Um, sort of, um, you know, changing or exploring and changing your mind or your perception, the way, you know, that you see the world um, and, and yes. you know, embracing, getting more into the relativity of, uh, you know, your per perception. And uh, to me, that's a big part of what psychedelics do, um, especially uh, I feel like LSD uh, particularly seems to do that. Right. Um, part, part of how I sometimes say it, um, I just say it, it, a big part of what it does is it decontextualizes experience. So, like, you know, we go through our life and we have, you know, it's not vocalized, but we have this firm understanding in our mind about where we are and what we're doing, you know, what the context is. We have a general understanding of the context. And when you take mm -hmm. a psychedelic, it sort of decontextualizes your experience to where you're like, oh, wow, like, I could see this in so many different ways than I ordinarily right. see it, you know. And yeah. It, it really opens yeah. up that power of you know personal perspective and the relativity and the potential to change it. Yes, exactly. Like, yeah, you can't really. Um, I don't know if you're talking about personal issues or problems and things. You can't really um, fix something if it's broken um, if you can't see that it's broken. You know, not that things up, you know, necessarily broken, but it's just that idea of, um, yeah, I think we're on the same page with how I was talking about shifting your perspective yeah. there with that, being able to see things from different angles or or different, um, I don't know, dimensions even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, right. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, uh, yeah. it, it definitely they can reveal you like they reveal you to yourself you know they reveal uh, your own mind mm -hmm. to yourself and you just get to see more clearly you know your tendencies that you might not really acknowledge normally and then when you're on a psychedelic it just exposes it so obviously right yeah so I've um, I found that with um, with cannabis um, in a big way, um, when I was younger, almost too too much in a big uh, too much of a way with that, um, uh -huh. very intense. But um, I do I do um, see a lot of benefit in the use of cannabis. Um, 
Yeah. But for me, it has to be small amounts, and I hardly ever use it, to be honest. Um, it's a very sort of um, particular or controlled kind of process for me. Um, That's and a good thing, probably, I would say. I mean, it's yeah. uh, I, I cannot even remotely claim to stick to it myself, but it's probably a good idea. Right. Uh, <laughs> really. Oh, but everyone's different. I'm just saying, for me, you know, um, no, yeah, I can't, it just makes my mind too hazy otherwise, but um, uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, it's the same thing as Terence McKenna. It's pretty funny because right. uh, Terence McKenna, uh, you know, he he smoked uh, heavy all the time. He smoked heavy amounts, right, large yeah, amounts yeah. at all times. And then, but he said, and sometimes people quote him as saying, he said, "I think the best way to use cannabis is uh, once a week, and then as much as you can possibly." Stand like you just bow, you just over, you just flood, you flood your mind infrequently. Oh, like, like, oh you mean as he, in he talked all the about time, using right? it infrequently. He, well, he said ideally, right. probably the best way to do it is infrequently, but then when you do it, really flood your your mind with it. He said that would also expose to people um, its psychedelic properties uh, more than oh, people right. often do. That's another thing. It becomes. Um... It's one of those dr those drugs that I guess um, it, if you only use it very occasionally, it can be quite a psychedelic experience. So for me, it actually is quite a yeah. psychedelic experience, like um, just having you know using cannabis. Um, yeah. But if awesome. I use it, I envy it. I'm so, I'm, I use it so much now. It's just like life. So uh, right. <laughs> I, I envy yeah, it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and some people operate well on that. That's fine. Um, but, um, yeah, I also, um, you know, um, have spent time in the past um, experimenting with it as a, um, a synergistic ingredient, so to speak. Oh, with it's the number one synergistic tool there is, for sure. Right, right. yeah, I know that you've, you've sort of felt this too. So um, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. And it's a relatively safe one for me, cannabis, because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, probably. Just, I don't want to have to go into that, but, um, you know, um, yeah, and it's easy to control the amount right. to a degree. Um, yeah. I, I've experimented with salvia divinorum um, from, uh, I don't know, from a long time ago, and um, it's a plant that I deeply respect, and um, I don't, all of these things I don't, I don't use often, but when I do, it's it's um, with, with a um, quite, um, how do I put it, uh, determined intention, I guess. Um, right, and which is the perfect, self, it's the ideal way to do it. So. Right. Yeah, and salvia is um, another one of those things that rem what you, you reminded me of when you said um, it can throw a lot out there about your own personal um, psychology or world, or and um, yeah. and kick you in the ass sometimes, right? But um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that can be. I've had a few um, experiments experiences with salvia where that's been. Um, a big part of it, just but on a a very a deeper level than than cannabis. Um, right. Yeah, much more kind of reality shattering might be a yeah. good way to put it. Way not right. not not necessarily um, freak out way. Um, no. Although I will say I will say that I don't recommend. Um, salvia for everyone. Um, yeah, I, I well, think I can take certain things, experiences like with psychedelics um, pretty pretty well. Um, right. But I have seen, just even growing up as a teenager, seen people, um, uh, not necessarily salvia, but um, experimenting with other drugs, just just not not of the right kind of um, uh, mind, really, or, or uh, yeah. capacity to, right. to really um, to go to certain places with them. Um, right. But it yeah. was my path. It, and, yeah. It's yeah. Um, when I uh, – now, Salvia was the first psychedelic I ever did, um, and I was in high school and uh, was not uh, prepared at all. Um, <laughs> it was uh, – uh -huh. <laughs> I would like to do it now, to be honest with you, because uh, I have not. When I did it, 
it was before I had ever gotten, really got in a real way, gotten into spirituality or philosophy or any of that kind of shit. So it was, right. like I said, the worst context. First of all, it was the very high extract uh, stuff that I did, like the highest available yeah. extract, like 40 or 50x. Yes. And um, mm-hmm. it was the worst context possible because I was just, I was at a party. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. we were drinking, I'm sure. Someone's like, hey, you want to yeah. wanna smoke some salvia? I'm like, what is salvia? Yeah. He's like, that's a plant, you know, it's mm, kind of like weed. It's more powerful, but, you know, it's kind of like that. And I'm like, all right, fuck it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was insane. I mean, that was – I've done DMT a number of times, and, I, I, I mean, it's like I said, the context is so different now versus high school. But in my experience, I would have to say that salvia is the most powerful breakthrough right. experience I've ever had. Um because yeah, like when, well, when I do salvia or uh, DMT or ketamine, which are you know basically breakthrough type of substances in their own way, um, but either of them when I do it, I'm like, all right, now lay down and close your eyes and let it happen, kind of thing. Whereas with mm-hmm. salvia, um, I had no awareness of my eyes being open or closed. I didn't try to make anything happen. I was just all of a sudden I was somewhere else <laughs> and. Uh, and it's not like, oh, if I open mm-hmm. my eyes, like there was no concept of my eyes being open or closed. That was just somewhere else. It, it has that kind of, especially if it's, like you said, an extract and you're smoking it, to just take control of the situation and you're not really, um, i found anyway, um, so much in control, which kind of can be a cool thing. It's like, it's like here we go, you know, <laughs> what have you got for me? Um, yes, I'm buckle you know, up, I'm here we go. Yeah, buckle up, exactly right. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, it can be quite a terrifying um, experience. Yeah, that's where um, I was getting with it. Uh, cause you talked about how, you know, and you're not even sure if you would recommend it or whatever because I know, and again, I was in high school and a lot of my friends did it. A lot of people, we were doing it. It was legal at the time. and We just buy it and do it. And, um, yeah, and, right. um, yeah. and I don't think I ever, ever knew of anyone doing it and not finding it terrifying. Everyone who ever did it was terrified. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I never literally heard yeah. of anyone doing it and not being terrifying. Uh, so that seems right. to be the quality of it. Um, although I believe that's why I'd be so interested in doing it again now because now I have right. experience and I have a philosophic yes. and spiritual con- yes. background to contextualize it. At the time, it yes. was just I had never thought anything, and it was just telling me, like my experience was that it told me I was like a molecule and the super being and my whole life was like a dream or a hallucination and this was the true reality and you were never going to go back because this is it. This is what life is and there's no free will because you're just this being and you're a molecule and you're just going along for the ride. And I never thought of anything even like that ever. And I so that was the scariest thing that had ever I, – I was like – to me, I was just screaming in terror. I was like, ah! like literally just screaming terrified uh, and uh, that's not what I was doing in my body but to me that's what I was doing I guess I was giggling really, really I was just giggling like acting like an idiot but yeah. to, me, to me I was like ah and um, but you know but now if I heard if that perspective was shown to me or any or some other perspective most likely it would be something I'd come across or thought of mm-hmm. or considered something like mm-hmm. that before so now I'm like okay then I can explore it rather than being like what in the fuck is this you know, and right. so I would love to do it again. And I find it, I find it oddly, even though it's a sort of quasi legal in that uh, there's some states mm-hmm. that it is legal, almost because it's quasi legal. I think I actually find it to be the hardest of all substances to get. Uh, I found it virtually right. impossible to get salvia, <laughs> and I can mm-hmm. you know, get anything else. So it's kind of yeah, odd. yeah. It's it's one of those one of those funny ones. I um, and also I think a lot. I mean how. <laughs> That's often how you experience psychedelics for the first time. You know, it's within a more relaxed, casual, social yeah. environment, and that's fine. You know, um, I personally don't think um, particularly salvia is a good. Um, oh, no, I would not recommend going one. about it the way I did it. <laughs> but you know, um, maybe there's a lot of people who um, smoke some salvia at some party and had a horrible experience, but something stuck with it. Um, in their mind, and it, and, it, and it became something for them that actually, um, just as we said before, shifted their perspective about reality um, yeah. in a good way, in a productive way, and that's what it's always got to be about for me. But um, right. And I think also with that, some of these things, like particularly plants, they kind of govern themselves. I, I just, I really believe 
there's a big part of that um, where most people who, who take salvia in that sort of situation um, freak out and they're not going to touch it again. Like it's yeah, just, exactly. that's what I hear from most other people like, oh, I don't do that. That's weird. And, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's because it's not something, it's not really something that they need or want to get anything out of or, or right. it doesn't have anything for them. Whereas for someone. They don't understand the purpose or the point. Like why, you know. Yeah. Or maybe they don't need a purpose or a point with it in their life. You know, it's right. not, it's not for them and, and um, they're not, for the plant, you know, um, whereas someone like me who has an interest in maybe the deeper aspects of um, of um, just uh, whew, awareness about um, certain aspects of my own life and and our life collectively, and um, even um, getting into spiritual um, um, sort of perspectives and connections. Um, yeah. It's something that's quite meaningful to me, or can be, and um, yeah. so that's how I approach it. And I've found, you know, I had to go through processes with, with some of these things, um, uh, just like interests and maybe alternative modes of thought, like occult philosophy, um, but right. with plant and, and psychedelics, where um, I had to experiment, and there's... And there's um, you know, that process of figuring out what does work for you or what doesn't or what things even are and what they're not. You know, you have ideas about things and you right. think you understand something, but you don't really until until you experience it to some degree. Right. And, um, and so you have to go through that process and, and, you know, you don't, you sort of leave behind the things that don't work for you and embrace the things that do. Right. And um, Salvia, I would say... <clears throat> Is probably the trickiest plant um, that I've ever worked with, um, yeah. but to this day, for me personally, it, it's um, it's something that I hold a lot of respect for, and um, it's weird because I wouldn't I don't wouldn't want to promote it just personally, but for me, it, it's it's I've I've developed a a meaningful um, and I would say spiritual connection with that plant, yeah. and um, but I don't know if everyone would. So yeah, it's well, just a matter of um, figuring that out. There's like a I don't know if you're familiar. There's um, an author Carlos Castaneda. He wrote about um, Don Juan. He's like supposedly, and some people question the legitimacy of the story, but whatever. It's like this shaman, right, yeah. uh, this Mexican shaman or whatever. And uh, I'm, I'm aware we're of going, it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I mean, to me, there's very interesting ideas there, and I don't really even care that much about whether it literally happened or not. I don't really think that's particularly important because right. it's just the ideas. I, I like to judge the ideas on their own merit. Yeah. I guess is how I see it. Um, maybe, maybe the stories are just a vehicle for yeah. him to share his philosophies and and exactly. thoughts about. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's how I look at it. And um, I know one of the what you've been talking about as far as the plants and the connections reminds me of it's one of the things that in, the, in it Don Juan uh, talks about is um, plant allies. Um, and you know how right. plants are potential allies, and and pretty much you know we can sort of form like alliances with plants in a certain kind of way. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And it's all been said before, really, but. Um, you know, McKenna talked a lot about that and his research with, um, you know, um, shamanistic practices yeah. and indigenous um, approaches to all this. But um, I, I, I have felt more and more when I work with plants that that's a really an important aspect of it, um, at least for me. And I, and um, I think there's something I I I would I thought we might touch on um, regarding dangers and caution with experimenting or using drugs in general, but um, uh -huh. um, sometimes a certain approach um, with a tool, like say a plant, engenders um, a certain amount of safety just through working with it a certain way. And uh -huh. um, yeah, I think that. Um, that with with that whole kind of 
um, you know, like people who are using ayahuasca and um, and things like that as well, the more traditional based approach, um, yeah. because it's been something that's developed over a long, long period of time. Right. Um, yeah, it holds a lot of value, um, particularly with the safety side of things. And I'm mm -hmm. actually talking more about psychological aspects, not right. um, the physical. Um, so, you know, well, basically contact, not, not, you know, not losing um... your mind or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, right. so, so for this, again, this is a certain way of seeing things. So things like yeah. um, when you talk about plant entities and spirits and developing a connection with a plant spirit, for instance. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, that's one approach to work with these things, and um, I don't know what's best, but I've found more and more that, that I connect with it that way better than just smoking some high extract salvia and tripping out off to another dimension. Um, yeah. I have nothing yeah. against that, okay, yeah. um, and, and, you know, I have sort of experimented in different ways with that stuff, but... Um, yeah. I will say about salvia that um, my feeling, as I as as I've worked with it more, um, has gravitated much more respect with the idea of it being used um, uh, more traditional approaches. So right. not the smoking, but the actual chewing of the leaves. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in that. I've heard good. That's a yeah, traditional way, certainly. So, so, and and what's in what becomes involved with that is that you're actually consuming it in a different way, and you're consuming the right. um, the leaf matter um, right. as opposed to burning it in smoke. And for for me, it's the connotations as well. So, um, you know, it's the connotations of actually consuming the flesh of the plant and yeah. how that um, is integrated it's into like the whole... like sacrament, you know, like a sacrament. Yeah, like the a, whole experience. Consuming the body exactly. of Christ, so to speak, uh, metaphorically, mm -hmm. another manifestation yeah. of that. And it's funny, you know, when you take psychedelics, you, you start to realize that these things um, can actually be quite important, these yeah. sort of details. Um, with experience in life, yeah. even so, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention yeah. that um, because it's something that I've found, and I've worked with Salvia for many, many years, yeah. um, very intermittently. Right. Um, you know, I'll go years without, you know, touch, touching it, but um, and, and then I, I might. It just depends on life circumstances. And I'd love um, to experience with the levels of it more, and and it sounds like right. also um, chew, you know, actually chewing it um, in, in that yes. way. It, it definitely, I'd be interested in trying that. Yeah, and all the information's out there um, for how to do that correctly. And um, yeah, I think there's a website called Sage Wisdom, or if you just Google that, Sage Wisdom. Um, uh -huh. Dot org maybe. Um, um, Gosh, it's been so long. I've forgotten his name, but he was the um, <laughs> one of the original um, people. Um, I think he's a botanist, maybe, who um, who um, started that website. And uh -huh. yeah, he's got some really good advice about it. All. Okay. And um, I um, yeah. Well, what you were talking about, as far as um, especially you know, well, plants specifically, and the idea of there being sort of spirits within the plants or whatever. Um, it made me think of um, something I believe it was Terence McKenna talked about that I found interesting. Um, he talks about the difference between ta taking a plant and taking another psychedelic, and he describes mm -hmm. it like um, like when you take mushrooms, for instance. Like uh, he describes it as if a, a chemical or, or a drug or a plant or whatever. It's like um, somehow there's a interaction, there's an interfacing between the plant and the person who takes it, and somehow over time uh, the plant develops an, an energy or an essence or or whatever, a certain way, it, it uh, takes content into itself mm. almost through interfacing with people's minds, and so there's like, a, he, he thinks that there's like a lot of content basically there because like it's been, uh, people have downloaded their, you know, their minds. Or so it's their like a, it's a receptive thing, so it's yeah. not just one way, it's actually, yeah. It's a back and yeah. forth. Yeah, yeah and well, he, from my kind of... Um, uh, views and or sort of uh, whatever perspectives on a, like a cult philosophy. It sort of takes that into account as well. It's you know, um, it's that whole 
get unknown or spirit realm of what's going on there, you know, right. um, beyond sort of rational science, I guess. And, right. Um, yeah. Um, I it's, believe. It's weird. I, yeah, it's it's an yeah. it's weird stuff. It's an interesting uh, concept. I believe, if I remember correctly, the context in which I heard him uh, say that idea was actually mm. he was talking about uh, ketamine. Uh, rarely did he talk about ketamine, oh, wow. but I think I was specifically yes, trying to find. Yes. I was specifically trying right. to find a video or whatever of him talking about ketamine. I think oh, that is where I heard point. this. Right. And uh, one of the things yeah. he said, it, it relates, I found really interesting. It, it pretty much he said that, um, so like mushrooms have this long history that's sort of et etched it in, all this content and what it is, it's sort of uh, become yeah. populated almost. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. whereas he described ketamine as, as being so new on the scene and and so sort of unexplored, certainly relatively to, relatively to like mushrooms, that he, he said it's almost like a blank s slate. Um, mm. it, it's much more of a blank slate that almost mm. it, it's not it's not pre-populated almost like you got to make it what it is, which I so actually, is that kind of like there's not much history there for us to yeah to it, well, kind it, of pull from as well yeah like it's like right. perhaps mm. uh, when we take some of the more traditional psychedelics and we get all these perspectives and <laughs> visions and all that maybe maybe those visions come from the fact that they're already in like the database of that substance and it's like it's right. content that's already there and it's and because other people have uploaded it into it so we naturally tap into that and when you take a newer substance mm -hmm. that's much less used that hasn't had nearly the same amount of information uploaded into it so you're not given as mu the same sort of content and it's more of a blank slate that's for right. you to kind of mold yeah. in a way. Well, it kind of makes sense. I mean, with let's take mushrooms for example, but with that idea, um, maybe um, the collective unconscious comes into play here, um, yeah. where you know we collectively there's this whole realm of you know like a um, like a um, super brain or something that is just our collective awareness about something, and that's where it's going back to that information and um, and so um, that's where that history is and it's all it's all more to do with the unconscious so um, when we um, when we talk about accessing that information um, you know it's it's there from how many millennia ago yeah. um, but it's there in some way and um, whereas something like ketamine which is a kind of new sort of um, you know um, synthetic, synthesized synthetic um, substance yeah um, yeah what what do we have to draw from apart from maybe was it uh, John C. Lilly John Lilly he's, uh, <laughs> he's, the, he's the man I love John Lilly and uh, yeah, right. I knew that was true something <laughs> He went in on ketamine, like I, like literally. Right. I mean, I, I mean, it's not. I'm not saying it's a good thing to do, but I admire his commitment to just right. like yeah. he explored. I, I think he might have like went further in terms of like exploring, uh, transforming your life using a psychedelic in a totally all-encompassing mm -hmm. way. Probably, maybe more than anyone ever has. I mean, I, I, I that sounds. Right. Uh, you know, dramatic, but um, you know, he, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but um, for mm -hmm. an extended period of time, months and months, um, he would inject himself with a uh, full dose of ketamine uh, every single hour, uh, 20 hours a day. <laughs> and wow. him, so four yeah. hours of sleep, he'd wake up and just every single hour, ketamine injection, ketamine. And he lived life for months on <laughs> full-blown ketamine doses. I mean, that's... Right. Well, again, I'm not yeah. recommending it, but I'm saying that's commitment. I mean, how it is that's, pretty committed. that's real commitment, and I and it's I, I find it fascinating, and that that was something uh, you you read in his writings where he talks about it. That's something he became. You could see sort of his thought process developing. It was something he was interested in. Like, well, what happens if you redose, mm -hmm. and then it extends the duration and all this and that. And he he became interested mm -hmm. in that because you know when you're on you know like you might do ketamine and this is, was his thing, and you'll have, you'll have these perspectives, these really out there, outlandish perspectives that might occur to you, or what sound to be outlandish, whatever, out there perspectives that occur to you on ketamine, and then you, mm -hmm. normally you come back, you're okay, what the fuck, like, all right, so what do I do with that? But he 
just tried to live <laughs> in that state at all times. So like he would have these weird sort of ideas about what was going on in the world, and he would just right. literally live like it wasn't just an idea. He was living life like that is truly what's happening. And I, mm-hmm. there's something interesting about that. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of taken it pretty far, though, right? Like, it <laughs> right. makes you wonder about how important is consensual reality. I mean, yeah. what is consensual reality as well? But how important yeah. is that? And I mean, he was on his own trip or research there, I guess. But I thought um, he said it. I'm researching. Yeah. They, they asked him, "Are you? Are you? Would you say that you got uh, are or got addicted to ketamine?" He said, "Well, I would say that I'm a very committed researcher. Others might say I'm, I got addicted. I don't know." <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think ketamine's um, physically. It's it's counted under a physically addictive drug, right? Um, it, it, is it? It might be um, actually, might um, be. but oh, okay. but the thing but the thing about it, as far as it being physically addictive, and now first of all, I wouldn't say that, that was what happened with Lily. I mean, he was mm-hmm. he was trying something out, you know, and maybe yeah, he's a scientist. Right? It wasn't yeah. like he just got addicted. He, he was exploring something and experimenting basically he and had um, a specific intention to yeah i mean first of all think yeah. about it to inject yourself every single hour on the hour 20 hours a day that's not ordinary that's, drug that's use serious commitment that's right. not that's not yeah, yeah. a typical behavior pattern of drug addiction or whatever you know there's something else no. going on there yeah. um and yeah. he um he's exploring realms yeah, That's and sure. the thing about ketamine, as far as its addictiveness, uh, addictive potential, um, I think because the truth is, is most people who use ketamine, I think the majority of its use is not uh, entheogenic or visionary or psychedelic or however you might want to look at it. That's not how people, more often than not, are using it. Uh, more often than not, how people are using it is, um, I mean, they basically use it. They they snort it in like clubs and stuff like that. It's like a mm. they, they use it at clubs. A it's a party thing. It's a party. I don't know. Yeah. I don't understand it because the, the apparently <laughs> a lot of people are using it in a party context, <laughs> um, which I don't understand either. But obviously, it's a dose thing. I mean, I, I mean, I can't. There's no way I could do that mm. in my ketamine experiences. But there's. But first of all, and this is. A bit, it was a big barrier to me doing it, and it's a big barrier to a, a lot of people doing it, I think, is the fact that um, ketamine, it, I, a lot of people have said, and I have found this to be true, it, it appears that you have to inject it, uh, you know, it's, it can be in the muscle, which is a different thing than in the vein, but right. you have to, if you snort it or, or do it in any other method, it does not give you that kind of experience. As far as I can tell, and I've read a lot of people say that, it just seems it's impossible to... Uh, create right. that kind of experience in any other way than injecting it, which is maybe unfortunate, but yeah. it's kind of a reality with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, intense. Um, but <laughs> I do, I do. I've read some of Lily's stuff. Um, yeah. And I do find that whole um, area interesting. Um, yeah. I've experimented with. Um, dissociatives myself um, for various certain um, reasons and tensions um, yeah. for personal work uh, and I I definitely um, found that um, some which I've actually talked to you about before some um, <laughs> some things that I've done have sound very similar or seem similar to what I've read about ketamine yeah and an interesting place it takes me is very much within the realm of understanding the nature of existence. Yeah. Um, and I just find that fascinating. And um, I'm not sure how productive it is, but it's one of those things that it, it brings me back always um, yeah. to... Um, to that interest um, of the almost like um, I wouldn't say building blocks, but um, I'd use the word term. I don't know, like vibrations of of um, existence, even and yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's just fascinating to me. But um, I can't like yeah, it's hard to um, to use dissociatives. That's a hard, and it's edging more towards um, physical, kind of um, 
you know, uh, for what I see as something maybe edging a bit more on the dangerous side physically with those type of um, yeah. mind altering substances. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I so, know, like ketamine certainly. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's not on the same. I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's, it, well, like, for instance, there's um, no such thing as like a, like a, lethal or, or whatever dose for, you know, LSD or something like that. Now, ketamine, mm -hmm. the thing about it, especially now they say that uh, the real issues, as I understand it, can come from, it, it can involve your kidney, and the real issue, as I understand it, comes from repetitive use, because mm -hmm. some people use it over and over and over, like every day, a lot of it. Some people mm -hmm. really go hardcore with it, and I think that is where the issues um pop up and so it's you know it's it's is another level because th that doesn't exist with something like LSD you know you don't got to worry about mm -hmm. that with a, something like LSD or mushrooms but it does exist with ketamine mm -hmm. but I don't think it's it doesn't necessarily apply to infrequent um, spiritual and, and one key point that it seems like a lot of people don't really get that is a major point to me because uh, ketamine is approved uh, for use as an anesthetic uh, medically, the FDA, it's, it's approved, at least in America. I don't know about yes. other countries, but in America, it's it's approved. Uh, it's not used because it's, of its psychedelic effects, but it is approved, and it's actually mm -hmm. considered to be safer um, than the anesthetics that they do use because uh, the unique thing about it anesthetically is it doesn't depress your uh, respiratory system, so it doesn't affect your breathing, yeah. um, and, so, and that's a right. potential concern with other... Anesthetics. But mm. my point being is that the dosage that it's approved of anesthetically and considered to be safe is 10 plus times higher than anyone would take uh, using it for like a psychedelic sort of purpose. So, mm. I mean, if it's mm. considered safe and medically approved to use over 10 times more, then you mm. don't really got to be concerned like, oh, I'm taking too much maybe because, I mean, it's a fraction of what is approved and considered safe. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I guess it's just one of those things that's hard to, um, you know, obtain as well. And yeah, and is and but I think that's probably a good thing. Yeah, because like you said, I mean, there's people who just take it over and over yeah. again, and it's yeah, people, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, people. Most people, I think, have an addictive nature with things, whether it's chemical or just, um, you know, psychological. And um, right. Yeah. Whereas that's, that's another thing with inherently with plants that, um, you know, they kind of um, there's generally something more involved there than just a kind of out of body, <clears throat> maybe blissful experience. There's there's a sacrifice going on with the experience or journey. Um, yeah. And you're not going to do it just to, you know, right. trip out, really, um, to a certain degree. You know, there's there's definitely uh, a um, commitment um, wow. that, that involves effort and work. And, right. yeah, I'm talking about things like mushrooms or, or salvia yeah. and that well, sort of stuff. Yeah. That's another idea Terrence McKenna talked about that's pretty interesting is um, – you know, because he has this idea that there was this sort of, there was this sort of, there's this sort of paradise that existed deeper in history, um, in which uh, mm. we lived this sort of uh, natural life, and and part of what it was was that we were consuming mushrooms on probably maybe along with the lunar cycles or something, but and it, and mm. we had this sort of symbiotic relationship. Uh, with mushrooms that, exi according to him, existed for a long time. And uh, what you say about people being addictive, that's something I remember him saying. He said something to the effect of humans are, humans are creatures which tend to addict. And, um, and he's also said that a lot of that addiction comes from a recognition within our psyche, uh, a remembrance at some level of a time uh, when we had this symbiotic yeah. uh, relationship with mushrooms and we've lost, uh, that connection was severed, but part of us remembers it at some level and so we, we try to seek out right. that thing that we lost and we don't know what it is so we addict to this and that and all these different things based on the fact of an right. inner remembrance of what we used to have uh, with mushrooms. And I don't know if it's true or not, but certainly an interesting idea. Interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. you never know. I, I do also think that we are creatures of habit as well. Like, that's a big part of our, you know, um, inescapable psychology. And um, but, but you can use that to your advantage as well. And yeah. That's like, if we're talking about 
the, if we're talking about the occult and magic and, and things like that, um, that's a big part of that is basically it's, um, yeah, uh, ceremonial magic or ritual magic. It's about ritual and, and, and utilizing that aspect of our, um, our, our, our brain that, that, um, connects well to ritualizing things and, right. um, and, and utilizing that to our right. own sort of in a productive way. Yeah. Well, there's power in our habits, you know, there's power yeah. in doing something over and over and in a certain way, you know, there's a certain energy to that. And I guess that's kind of what mm -hmm. the concept of ritual is trying to take control mm -hmm. over that, whatever that is, and to take control of it and try mm -hmm. to sort of willfully direct it. Yeah, exactly. With intention. Right. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. um, <clears throat> All right, well, it's been great talking to you, Jay. Uh, I've enjoyed having you on. Uh, I think we have a great conversation, and I'd love to have you on and do it again sometime. Yeah, I loved it. It's been, it's been great. Thanks, Clay. And, um, yeah, I, all the best with your group as well and the um, future podcast, too. I think it's really cool. I've been enjoying watching them myself, so it's been great to actually have a chat with you, too, and be a part of it. So, I appreciate it. I'll talk to you Cheers. later. I guess goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you.